we heard prior to the uh, Jackson Texan attack. By way of introduction to all of this, uh, again, as you're sort of thrashing around in your seats, uh, let me re remind you that we live in sort of a microbial jungle, or, or if you prefer it, a swamp. Uh, as you take a deep breath, there are bazillions of microbes in the air that you're inhaling. Uh, the surfaces around you that you're, you're putting your fingers on and so forth, they are laden with microbes. Uh, when someone sits down next to you, uh, the woman who just sat down there dumped a bazillion organisms on her neighbor. Uh, <laughs> Stuff is microbes are on our fingers as we suck our thumbs in class. They're, they're in our food. And, and most of us, I think most of you have been brought up uh, with the idea that these microbes are enemies. We call them germs. And, and they're threatening things to be avoided. And you, you know all the ads and, and you open up anybody's cupboard and you see Lysol sprays for killing these bugs, germicidal soaps. Uh, we want our food to be impeccably prepared, and of course the dish is clean and so forth. And uh, in, in a hospital environment, I have to tell you, certain aspects of this are true. You've got to learn to wash your hands between every single patient. Uh, otherwise, it can get dangerous. But on the whole, in many other respects, uh, microbes are uh, actually uh, our friends, and they're it turns out essential to our well-being, and that's one of the things I really want to emphasize this morning. Well, that's a very good thing that microbes are our friends, because inevitably we're all colonized by amazing numbers of, of little guys, mostly bacteria. There are fungi and some other things, but mostly bacteria. And it's absolutely inevitable that you're going to play host to lots and lots of these organisms. Now, the fetus in the, in the intact amniotic sac, the fetus is absolutely sterile normally. The, the membranes rupture, and as the fetus begins to go down the birth canal, boy, is that yummy. You got this, 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 this mass of, of yummy stuff, nice and moist and warm. It's like a huge petri dish just waiting to be inoculated. And, and that's what happens. It begins the moment of birth, the, the fetus, uh, the infant, starts getting colonized, uh, and eventually every interface with the environment, every niche that's available is colonized by uh, huge numbers of organisms. They constitute a normal resident flora, ultimately. It takes some months or even a couple years to reach the definitive state, but then every nook is filled and we have a resident microbial flora. The numbers are absolutely phenomenal, and I, I scraped some stuff out of the literature uh, the other night. I was just, I thought I'd lay these on you. The skin. Uh, if you take a square centimeter of skin, cut it out and put it in a wearing blender, you know, get it all mushed up and plate it out on petri dishes so you can count the, the colonies, the numbers of organisms range from, uh, if you just take superficial scrapings from the skin, I mean it's clean, you wash your hands and scrape it a little bit, 10,000 organisms per square centimeter. If you go deeper in the skin, and this seems paradoxical, but the, the hair follicles are, oh, are they wonderful. You go deeper in the skin, and the counts reach a million organisms per square centimeter. Uh, something to think about uh, for a variety of reasons, saliva contains 10 million organisms per milliliter. Uh, of, uh, of saliva. In the GI tract, particularly the colon, the numbers are astronomical. There's somewhere between four and five hundred species of organisms living there. Uh, someone with a lot of time in his hands has estimated there's about 1.2 kilos of microbes in the GI tract. Uh, it's, it's almost um, the mass of the liver, when you think about it. The liver is probably around 1,500 grams, and so you've got 1,200 grams of microbes. And uh, some people have referred to this as uh, this mass as the, the forgotten organ, and you'll see, you'll see why. About a third of the dry weight of feces is microbial. 
bacterial carcasses, I mean living and dead, bacteria. And a figure I absolutely love and I will not vouch for is that we are estimated, each of us, to defecate 128 trillion organisms per day. And, and that's 128 followed by 12 zeros. So it's, it's a lot of stuff. Now, what it boils down to is this. If you took a human being and, and sonicated the body or put it in a blender or something and counted the slurry, how many cells, it's estimated that we each have about 10 to the 13th power cells, mammalian cells. But if you take that same slurry and plate it out on petri dishes with appropriate dilutions, you got about 10 to the 14th microbial cells. Now when you think of it, that means you are 10% you and 90% someone else. <laughs> and uh, looking at it on a molecular basis, it's estimated that the microbial genes, and it's again, largely bacterial, but the microbial genes outnumber your genes by about 150 to one, something like that. So it's a very significant population. Now, having said that, what I want to convince you next is that this is an important, intrinsic part of the body. And there are a number of principles I want to, want to elaborate on. First of all, this, this microbial flora is not random. You might think, well, I'm a big petri dish and anything I come across is going to grow in me. It doesn't work that way because microbes have their, their requirements as far as pH, oxidation, uh, or oxygen concentration, other things, and they will only grow in areas that are uh, hospitable. Well, what this says is that uh, your, your pet dog or cat will have a different flora than you do because a different environment in various parts. So each species, host species, has a flora which is a little bit different from other host species. Uh, another thing is that the flora does not develop at random. You might think, well, that baby's coming down the, the birth canal and whatever organism it encounters, boom, that one's going to implant and so forth. It doesn't work that way because, and, and I don't have time to go into detail, but it turns out that certain organisms can, can, are adapted to go, uh, let's say, and, and start growing in the infant bowel right away. And by their growth, they change the pH, the oxygen concentration, and so on and so forth, and set the stage for yet or other organisms to come in. So there's an ecologic succession, and it takes some months until the definitive uh, stage is, is reached, because one organism prepares the way for the other, and then you've got two of them, the environment's a little different, and the third one can come in, and so forth. Then it turns out, that the microbes are not, 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 not randomly distributed in the individual. You might think, well, a big slurry of stuff is the same in the eyes and nose and so forth, but that isn't true because the uh, different interfaces with the environment provide different kinds of, uh, of uh, niches for the, for the bugs to grow in so that the flora of the nose will differ from the flora of the, the conjunctival sac around the eye. The flora of the mouth uh, is different than the flora in the genital urinary tract. I mean, there is a flora in, in each of these places. And uh, it's interesting, as far as the skin, it's turned out, I saw an article just uh, a couple of months ago in Science that uh, people are mapping the, uh, the habitat of organisms on the skin. And it turns out that the facial skin will have a different flora than the axillary skin, and that's different than the flora uh, in, the, in the bend of the elbow. A little bit different environment in each place, and it's, and it's a very specific sort of thing. Uh, even in the GI tract, it's fascinating and very important. You think of the GI tract as a tube going from mouth to anus, and it's not just simply a tube because there are different uh, <coughs> habitats at different points in that tube. Now you take the mouth, for instance. Oh, it's wonderful, there are these yummy gingival cre crevices, which are great places for organisms to grow, or even on the, on the rough surface of the tongue. That's a very different situation, uh, for instance, than in the stomach. And it's important to point out that in the stomach, there's very little resident flora 
And the reason for that has to do largely with the pH in the stomach. You've all learned that the stomach is very acid, and the, the acid pH in the stomach kills many organisms that, say, are, are swallowed and do reach the stomach alive. They hit the, the hydrochloric acid and boom. And that's a, actually, that's a very important defense of the GI tract. I mean, with the GI tract, there's a design problem. You've got all this lining area that Dr. Velke talked about, and you're internalizing the dirty environment in that. There have got to be defenses. And one of the major defenses in the stomach is hydrochloric acid. So there's very little flora in the stomach. It's not sterile, but there's very little. You get into the small intestine, and the few bugs that get through the stomach are whooshed through because the, the staying time in the small intestine isn't very long. You, you know about the transit time through various parts of the GI tract, and basically things get whooshed through the small intestine in so short a time that the bugs don't have a chance to proliferate uh, before they get washed further down. So the small intestine has a relatively low flora, at least until you get towards the ileum. Uh, the colon is a different matter, as we'll see. The colon is stagnant, and boy, that's a wonderful place uh, for organisms to grow. So there are different uh, flora at different points, in the, in, even uh, just in the GI tract. Now, wherever they are, there's a very intimate relationship between the microbes, largely bacteria again, and, and the walls of the uh, GI tract. And I'd like to illustrate that uh, for you uh, with some, some pictures. Um, this is drawn from mouse material, and you may say, ah, what do I want to look at a mouse? We can't, we can't do this with humans uh, because you can't get the samples. So you, you, we could get, we get pieces of bowel all the time from humans, but preoperatively they're subject to antibiotic therapy and so on and so forth, and, and so you can't see it like the, you can in an experimental animal. So I'll show you mouse, which differs from human in some details, but the generalizations are true. Now, <laughs> let me make a, a point about the specificity of different habitats. This is a mouse stomach. Esophagus coming down here, duodenum going out here, and this is a little different than human. This, uh, this, so uh, I'm making a general point here. You'll notice that there's a dividing line between sort of a white area and this darker area. In the mouse, the stratified squamous epithelium that lines the esophagus, you, you know that now, it's a st uh, stratified squamous, it actually forms this uh, part of the stomach here, so it's almost like an extension of the esophagus. But this is a continuous chamber through the stomach. When we open it up and wash it off, here is where the esophagus came in, and you see that stratified squamous epithelium right at that sharp boundary line, this becomes the glandular gastric mucosa that you all know and love now. Now, the point I want to make is that there's a very different uh, habitat between here and here. And I'll, I'll show you the, the following few pictures are taken with a scanning electron microscope. I don't know if you know that instrument, but basically it shoots a, a, a column of electrons at the surface of something. It's not a section, it's at the surface. The electrons bounce off and you get a picture. These pictures are like hovering with a helicopter. And you're looking down there and, oh, you see something and you move the helicopter closer. It's, it's just a wonderful, wonderful instrument. So with a scanning electron microscope, we took a look at this squamous epithelium here. And these are individual cell, squamous cells here. And you can see, this, is, this, this stomach had been washed, and it's got a, a whole bunch of stuff on the surface there, and those are rod-shaped bacteria by the bazillions. Here's a close-up. You bring the helicopter in close, you really take a look at it. And these things are anchored by very specific ligands. Uh, they're anchored to the underlying squamous epithelium. Now, to, just to show you the specificity of all this, in this same continuous chamber, in the same stomach, you go beyond that dividing line and you get into the glandular stomach. Here's a scanning micrograph of the glandular stomach. You see the gastric pits there. I've washed off the mucus uh, layer in part. This is the mucus layer. And you don't see much of anything there. And in fact, when I, when I lowered the helicopter down to get a very close look into one of those pits at high power, nobody home. 
This is a gastric pit. And again, this is just millimeters away from that population of, of uh, organisms uh, on the upper part of the stomach, and nothing there. All right, you move down into the small intestine, and you have studied now the villus structure of the small intestine. What you, you're, you're flying through the small intestine now and looking down at individual villi. There are a dozen or so in the field there sticking out at you like fingers, and I've washed off most of the mucus, and uh, this is what you're confronted with, and, and in life, uh, of course, there's liquid here, the, the ingesta, and the various secretions, and mucus, it's a very liquidy environment that's whooshing by these uh, villi pretty fast, and it's not surprising that there aren't many microbes to be seen there. Oh, you get the occasional one mixed up in the mucus, there may be something there, but in the mouse, and this is a little different than man, but again, it makes a general point. In the mouse, lo and behold, you get down towards the lower jejune, well, mostly towards the ileum, and there's a high power view of some of the villi, and they seem to have whiskers on them. This is an individual villus here. You're looking at individual epithelial cells, and there are whiskers in a very high power view. This is a microvillus surface of a single epithelial cell, you see that this filamentous bacterium is anchored in there. It's a perfectly normal part of the mouse flora. It doesn't get whooshed away because it's anchored in there, and it's a resident normal flora. Now, you go from there into the colon, and, and I'm speaking of, of even of humans now, particularly of humans, everything changes. Instead of the, the uh, contents being whooshed along at very high speed in the colon, things stagnate. Thank goodness uh, we could not gather here without our colons because uh, what it does, of course, is absorb a lot of water, uh, makes the fecal mass manageable, otherwise it would be too horrendous to contemplate. Uh, <laughs> So I like to think of the colon as a social organ. It lets us come together. <laughs> and uh, all of this stuff, this slurry of stuff that's dumped from the small intestine in the colon is, is a yummy culture medium. And the, the number of organisms, as I indicated to you before, just goes off into the uh, outer space. It is so large. And this is what it looks like. Uh, I've washed off the surface partly, so you're looking at the raw surface of the colon, you see the crypt openings there, and this nice furry blanket here on top of the colon is a, an impossibly dense mass of microbes. Again, four or five hundred species, uh, I'm not going to lay a lot of microbiology on you, these happen to, many of these happen to be uh, highly anaerobic organisms. In other words, they, were, they grow at a low redox potential, but boy, do they grow. And I'll give you a closer view of this blanket. Basically, you've got the mucus layer. This is a raw epithelium here. Got a mucus layer there, and embedded in this and, and carpeting it are these fantastic numbers of organisms uh, that live there all the time. Sure, a lot of them get passed through and they make up a, a lot of the feces, but things are so stagnant here that this is constantly proliferating, so there is a constantly resident uh, flora. This is a very stable population. It's like, uh, those of you who have studied uh, ecology, it's like a climax forest. It's reached a certain balance and it's hard to disrupt it. So it's very, very stable. And uh, what I want to emphasize from all of these pictures, and the same is certainly true of man, is the intimate relationship between this, this microbial mass and the lining of the GI tract. So, Given this closeness of association, and it's true at all levels of the tract, but you can particularly see it here, given this level of, of closeness, there must be some impact on the host. And that's what I want to turn to next and say, what is the, what is the impact? What is the, the contribution of all these bacteria, this microbial flora? What is the contribution uh, to the uh, host? And 
ideas have evolved in an interesting way. Uh, microbes have been known from uh, Leeuwenhoek's time when the compound microscope was, was invented. Uh, the foundations of microbiology were really laid in the 19th century, Pasteur and Koch and, and so forth. And this was a, uh, oh, I, another one of Colin, just to show you uh, in a colonic crypt. The, the concentration of organisms growing in a crypt. But at any rate, this guy uh, contributed a lot to early thought. Uh, this man is Eli Mechnikov. Uh, he's a, from his name, you'd guess he was a Russian. He did most of his work at the Pasteur Institute. Uh, he won the Nobel Prize, I think it was 1908, something like that. Shared it with Paul Ehrlich. And uh, Meshnikov's contribution was in a uh, study of the biology of phagocytic cells. And uh, even before Ramsberg, he knew about diapedesis and, and, and all of those things and, and, and won the Nobel Prize. But, but Meshnikov apparently had some sort of a deep Freudian thing about the bowel. And uh, I'll, I'll read you a translation from, from some of his writings, a marvelous book on the nature of man. And, and he says, the bacterial flora of the large intestine is the source of many poisons harmful to the body. And it is among such substances that we must look for the slow poisons which, now get this, in the absence of syphilis or alcoholism, produce the arteriosclerosis of old age. So uh, Mechnikov uh, wrote very extensively about the colon, and he called it a dis disharmony of evolution, a source of putrefaction and what he called auto-intoxication, something to be rid of. He fondly wished that, uh, you know, everyone could have a colectomy or something like that. And you laugh at this, but these ideas still linger. Uh, everybody, not everybody, a lot of people worry about keeping regular, getting rid of that stuff on a, on a regular basis. And there are, you can see it right in Ann Arbor, advertised high colonic irrigations to wash out the toxins and uh, periodic purges to get rid of the enemy and, and so forth. So this is uh, very much uh, the ghost of Mechnikov. But <laughs> More recently, we've come to realize that, uh, that 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 doesn't make any sense at all. First of all, on an evolutionary basis, it doesn't make sense that we would evolve with a flora uh, that that uh, would would be harmful. Uh, these are basically good guys that live uh, live with us, and and they do a lot for us. And what I hope you'll come away with is that, to a significant degree, we are what we are because of the organisms living in us. We're partners, okay? Now, there are many examples of this uh, in, in nature because all metazoan organisms have their complement of, of stuff, li microbes living on them and in them. Uh, one wonderful example, uh, ruminant animals, cattle have this very specialized stomach. Some of you know about this. And, and part of the stomach is a huge fermentation vat called a rumen. A rumen. And in the rumen, these hundreds of microbial species digest that, that stuff, that impossible stuff that the cattle uh, gnaw on. And they break it down and make it possible for the nutrients to be absorbed uh, by the animal. And so they clearly work in partnership. And, and essentially, these rumen organisms feed uh, the host. Termites, another homely example, the same way. Uh, there are uh, organisms, uh, I, be I believe they're actually protozoans, within the gut of the termite that help digest our homes as they, as they chew them up. And there are even examples uh, from, uh, from various organisms that the presence of a flora can influence development, normal development of one tissue or another. So there's, there's plenty of, of uh, precedent for this elsewhere uh, among animals. And the, and the same is, is true for humans. I mean, these bugs are our partners. So I want to look next at what sorts of things uh, does the microbial flora do for us. Most importantly, uh, the microflora is, is important for host defense. 
again, think about the GI tract. You've got this, this design problem. You've got a huge internal surface that's being exposed to everything that's being swallowed, and the food ha nutrients have to be absorbed very quickly and efficiently, and at the same time, the door has to be closed to potential invaders. And the flora contributes a lot of this. First of all, the microbial flora provides something that's been called colonization resistance. In other words, by its presence, uh, the, the flora is established there in those huge numbers that I showed you. And if a, if a potential pathogen is swallowed, makes it past the stomach and gets whooshed through the small intestine and so forth, uh, whoops, the, um, sorry about that. The uh, resonant microbial flora provides colonization resistance, makes it much less likely, I won't say impossible, but much less likely that an invader can hang on and colonize and, and invade. And this can happen, this colonization resistance involves a couple of things. First of all, uh, there may be a competition for attachment sites. A pathogen has to attach to the mucus layer or get into the epithelium in order to invade the host and the resident flora may occupy many of these attachment sites. So they're essentially blocking, uh, forming kind of, kind of a shield uh, against the, the invader. Uh, then there's a possibility uh, that a good share of this colonization resistance is competition for nutrients. When you've got these billions and trillions of organisms established there and, and eating metabolizing what's, what's, what's there, that's a lot of competition for a, a stranger that happens to, to wander in. And this, uh, by its metabolism, this resident flora may create an environment that's hostile to various invaders. And they may actually produce, uh, some of these bugs produce antibiotic substances. So that uh, probably accounts for this so-called colonization resistance. Then it turns out, and we'll talk about these things in a moment, actually there's a direct effect on the mucosal surface and the presence of that flora actually um, strengthens, so to speak, the, 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 the barrier function of the mucosa. And clearly, and I'll show you this in a moment, the presence of the microbial flora really tones up the immune system. You've heard about the GALT, the, the gut-associated lymphoid tissue. This presence of the flora really gives that a sort of a kickstart and has it ready to go. So these are all very, very important defensive functions of the flora. Then the, uh, collectively, the microbial flora of the GI tract is a big metabolic machine. Again, it's over a kilogram of stuff, and enzymes are produced. There are enzymes in the lumen of the GI tract that are microbial rather than human. Uh, vitamins can be produced and, and made available to the host. Uh, the, mi the microbes also digest and process various host secretions, uh, ingested foodstuffs, and even drugs can be processed. Exogenous drugs can be processed by the microflora. And I think you've heard this, uh, or will hear it, maybe, no, I guess you heard it from Dr. Williams, that uh, in, the, in the colon, for instance, the lining epithelial cells are nourished by byproducts of the metabolism of the flora. So it, it really is uh, a, a metabolic machine. And... Uh, I want to give you a feeling for, for what goes on at, you know, again, what goes on in this sense right at the, at the surface there, and I'll quickly review some of the stuff you've had already and you, you learned earlier this week. You recognize this is small intestine. There's submucosa, muscularis mucosae, lamina propria, and the, the epithelium. And uh, you, you've heard about this huge surface area. I guess they talk about it being the size of a tennis court and, and, and so forth. And uh, the barrier function is very important. Now, these goblet cells produce mucus. I've washed the mucus off of this section, but the mucus is, is somewhat of, of a barrier, a physical barrier. There's a physical barrier of an intact epithelium around here. That kind of keeps things out of, of the, the interior. 
Um, turns out you also know that things called defensins are, are secreted primarily by the panet cells and, and they are antimicrobial. That's another sort of defense uh, expressed right at the surface. And then in the lamina propria, you have this rich mixture of macrophages, lymphocytes, plasma cells. These are immune cells forming uh, a lot of the cell population of this, of this uh, lamina uh, propria. Same is true in the colon. Uh, where you see the, the, there's a little bit of the mucus up there and you see the intact epithelial layer, but again you'll notice that there is a well-developed lymphoid population in here, uh, population representing part of the immune system. And you know that uh, in some places there are actual aggregates of uh, uh, these, these uh, lymphocytes and macrophages, uh, they can be single follicles scattered along in the, in the uh, small intestine, particularly in the large intestine. The large intestine is a very heavily lymphoid organ. In the small intestine, uh, these form, uh, uh, you get multiple nodules underneath a dome like that forming actually pyres patches. And here's a scanning view of, a, of a, a couple of pyrus patches. Here you see the villi, and here you see this dome of special antigen presenting cells that, uh, that overlie this aggregate of lymphoid tissue. All of this forms the, the so-called GALT, the gut-associated lymphoid tissue. Uh, and this is a very important defense at this, this gut interface and, and even beyond. Now, given this intimate relationship between the microbial flora and this surface, uh, there, there, it stands to reason that there will be crosstalk between them. And uh, it turns out that, uh, that the flora has a direct effect on the epithelial uh, lining. Uh, I don't want to go into detail here, but, but there, at, a, at a molecular level, uh, uh, it stimulates the uh, secretion of, of various cytokines and so forth, a very direct, direct effect. It has a very significant effect on the uh, gut-associated lymphoid tissue. And I'll show you just a few quick pictures to illustrate this. And here I'm going to show you a comparison again with mouse material, but the difference between an animal with a conventional microbial load in it, microbial flora, and a germ-free animal. It's possible to raise animals through their life with no germs at all in, in isolators. And you can compare one with the other and, and see from that what the flora is doing. And here's an example. This is a small intestine of a germ-free mouse here and a conventional microbe-laden mouse over here. And when you look at them at first, you say, well, it's the same thing, a bunch of villi sticking up and so forth. But it turns out that the villi tend to be a little bit shorter here. The epithelial, individual epithelial cells are probably a little taller. Actually, their microvillus border is better developed here. The crypts are smaller here than here. And you learned, Dr. Velke, told you about the fact that there's constant renewal, rather rapid renewal, of, of cells uh, being born from stem cells down here and migrating up the villi and then being cast off into the lumen. And in the mouse, in the normal mouse, it turns out that's about a 48-hour turnover time. In other words, every 48 hours, the cell can move from there all the way up and out. The interesting thing is that in the germ-free animal, it takes twice as long. In other words, the flora does something to actually set that renewal time. And, and, and correspondingly, the cells, as they differentiate on their way up here, are different than in the absence of the flora. And one very striking thing is that the lamina propria that you know and love, that's full of lymphoid tissue of, of, the, of the galt, virtually unrepresented here. Very, very little in the way of, a, of a, an immune system showing itself here. I mean, the potential is there, but the fact is that this shows you that the normal microbial flora really kickstarts that, that, that uh, lymphoid tissue to get it up to speed. Same is true in the colon. This is the normal colon. Lots of bugs. See the bugs out there? There's a, one of that, 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 that garden of organisms. Uh, they would be 
that's a shrinkage space there. You can see the bugs raining down. But you see the lymphoid cells in the lamina propria in the germ-free animal? Squat. I mean, it's just, uh, they're, they're, they're not there. In the pyrus patches, same thing. There is a germ-free pyrus patch. It's, it's waiting to be stimulated. There is in the conventional animal with uh, a, a flora in it. And it turns out that there are other effects. The, actual rate of propulsion of stuff through the GI tract is influenced by the flora. And uh, I've studied this in the mouse, and it turns out that what, what, what is the, the normal mouse propulsion, in other words, the time from mouth to anus, is much, much slower in the absence of a flora. So what I'm really saying here is that many of the things that we take as normal develop the way they do because the flora is there. And uh, this goes even beyond the, the GI tract, it turns out. Uh, such things as mobile, mobilization of leukocytes into an area of inflammation is much more vigorous in a conventional animal with a flora than in a germ-free animal. Macrophage function is, let's say, better. I, I, I won't elaborate, but it's better in a conventional animal than in a, a germ-free animal. It turns out even that body temperature, of all things, is set in part, I mean, uh, maybe small part, uh, by the presence of the flora, and a germ-free animal has a lower, slightly lower body temperature, lower rate of metabolism, and so forth. So what we described here, I'll, I'll stop with the details, what we described here is a situation in which a bunch of different uh, species share the same habitat, they reach a stable equilibrium, and the equilibrium really determines the character of the area, the habitat, and uh, that's, that's really a classic description of an ecosystem. So what I want to leave you with above all is that the, the GI tract is an ecosystem. And there are other ecosystems in the body. We are walking, talking uh, ecosystems. And in the case of the GI tract, we have really three components. We have the host tissues, uh, we have the microbial flora, and the ingested nutrients that are, that are uh, available. So I want to segue very quickly to is, is the issue of uh, perturbations of this ecosystem. What happens when you perturb one or another part of this ecosystem? It should ch it potentially have a domino effect and change things. Uh, I'll get rid of diet and just simply tell you that ch changing the diet has to be very, very extreme to change to, to budge this, this fairly stable ecosystem. So that tends not to be a problem. But if we look at the uh, changing something within the host, then it can have some pretty good reverberations. Uh, sometimes surgery, I mean that's the extreme, may create short circuits between this part of the bowel and that part of the bowel, or may change the motility of the bowel. That can have serious implications uh, for what happens to the flora. Uh, some of these things happen spontaneously. There are conditions where the motility, for instance, of the small intestine decreases. And when you don't have that rapid whooshing through, the flora can skyrocket in, in the small intestine. I'll show you a really striking uh, oddment. I haven't seen this, but this one example. Uh, this is a, a length of small intestine, and you see these diverticula, little pouches, off the wall, of the bulges off the wall of the small intestine, each one like a, like a little appendix almost. And uh, it turns out that the stuff is stagnant within there, and you get a skyrocketing of the microbial population in the bowel like that, with, with diverticulosis of, uh, this is the small intestine now we're talking about. And you get what's called a contaminated small bowel syndrome, and because of the presence of those organisms where they don't belong, because of this defect, uh, you end up with uh, malabsorption and, and diarrhea and, and, and lots of problems just related to a perturbation of that uh, ecosystem. And, uh, oh, I'll point out another thing. You won't probably hear about it until next year. Uh, another sort of imbalance that can occur uh, is that in certain individuals, it probably has a genetic component, in certain individuals there is a 
uh, no, uh, an unusual, might call it an overreaction of the immune part of the mucosa to the microbial flora, and this is expressed as inflammatory bowel disease, such as ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, which you may have heard about. We believe now that this is a, a, uh, a bad uh, or derailed immune response to components of the flora, something wrong with the uh, lymphoid uh, tissue there that results in, in mucosal uh, injury. Another perturbation that I might mention, you've heard already, I think from Dr. Williams, and that is uh, um, when, when in, in the course of, of growing older, it usually happens that, that many of us in, in the population lose the ability to produce lactase. And that, when you can't produce enough lactase in your mucosa, that means the lactose in the diet, if you drink dairy products and so forth, the lactose ends up with all those microbes working on it and releasing gas and causing osmotic problems and, and gas and diarrhea uh, and lactose intolerance. Again, a strictly ecologic problem. Some of the most striking perturbations of the GI ecosystem, though, are iatrogenic, that means we cause them, we physicians cause them, and it's, it has to do with uh, antibiotic therapy. Uh, antibiotics are perfectly good for many, many things, but they have the potential of doing violence to the normal microbial flora. And when they knock down certain components of the flora, uh, then the host loses the benefit of, of, of the function uh, of the flora. And a uh, number of things can happen. Uh, an antibiotic can destroy part of the flora and cause a normal part of the flora to flourish in much larger numbers than, than otherwise. Uh, for instance, candida is a fungus that we all have in us that is small numbers and is doing fine, thank you. But if you knock down part of the flora, that fungus may flourish and produce candidiasis, I mean, actual an infection uh, with the fungus. Turns out that colonization resistance imparted by the normal flora can be reduced by antibiotics. And this is a very paradoxical thing, where a patient who's been given antibiotic may become more susceptible to some exogenous infection, some other infection. And there have been some interesting epidemiologic data which I've come across, for instance, that in salmonella outbreaks, you know, food, salmonella food poisoning, one of the risk factors for being infected is, is a recent dose of antibiotics for some other reason. So the flora gets disturbed, you become a little bit more susceptible than your neighbor to ingestion of salmonella. And the, the uh, sort of the epitome of all of this is something I think you've heard about a little bit uh, already, and that's the story of antibiotic-associated diarrhea and colitis. Uh, it's true of certain antibiotics in particular, but really many of them, uh, if they're given for perfectly good reasons, they may uh, knock down or out certain parts of the normal uh, microbial flora and an organism called Clostridium difficile, C. diff, which you all, I see some nodding, uh, begins to flourish in the colon and it produces a couple of toxins which really can whack away at the colon. They can produce at one end of the spectrum just a lot of diarrhea, at the other end a very destructive colitis. And you've seen pictures of this when you studied inflammation. You can appreciate them now. This is colonic mucosa, fairly intact there. Area of necrosis there. And from this area of necrosis, there's an outpouring, a volcano of fibrinopurulent exudate forming sort of a mat over the surface, and that is the pseudomembrane, and that is uh, the gross example of pseudomembrane. Each one of these is a little patch of fibrinopurulent exudate, and again, this is strictly an ecologic accident. There's, there's C. diff in this room now. I'm absolutely certain of it, that, that some of us have C. diff. It's around, yum, yum. Uh, but it causes no problem generally until the antibiotics come along. And how do you treat this? Well, you can treat it with certain, certain antibiotics. Uh, metronidazole, which you may have heard of, and vancomycin are used to knock down the C. diff and, and potentially take care of this. Uh, you also have to discontinue the evil antibiotic that caused it. 
but uh, sometimes it keeps recurring and recurring and recurring. A very effective treatment, which has never been popular, but makes a point here, is that you can give fecal enemas from a normal donor, sort of a fecal transplant, uh, to these people, and it's curative. It's astonishing, but, but unpopular. Uh, well, very, very quickly, uh, I point out that uh, many of these things that I've described have been known to the profession for a long time, but haven't made much impact on practice. And in uh, the last few years, though, it's dawned on people, particularly our European cousins, it's dawned on people that, well, if the microflora does all these good things uh, for people, maybe it's possible in, in various disease states or in prevention of various disease states to manipulate the flora so that it's to our advantage. You know, use the flora as a, as a tool. In Mechnikov, uh, Got to go back to Meshnikov. He had a wonderful idea. He, he was impressed with the fact that Bulgarian peasants lived to great old age. It was probably a myth, but, but he thought, boy, those Bulgarians are living to age 120, 130, must be something. And uh, like so many ethnic groups, the Bulgarians had fermented milk products. Yogurt! Ring a bell? Yogurt. And, and so he thought that what was happening here is that the lactobacilli in the yogurt were replacing all those terrible auto-intoxicative things in the, in the large bowel, and that's why they were living to be 130 years old. Uh, and there were even some Dan and Yogurt ads a few years ago showing an ancient uh, woman, uh, you know, with her, her son 120 and she's 140 and so forth, and smiling and eating Dan and Yogurt. Uh, well, a while ago, this is back in the 80s, someone got the idea that uh, there are such things as probiotics, they were named, and you should know about these words, so I'll just give it to you for a few minutes. Probiotic was thought to be a preparation containing live bugs that could enter the ecosystem, become part of the ecosystem, you're sprinkling seeds in there and they're growing, and that this would produce a positive health effect. Well, uh, that sounded pretty good, but it turns out that uh, when you try to implant organisms into this ecosystem, they don't take hold. If you, if you give a dose, it's gone. And so uh, they modified that idea saying, uh, well, if you keep giving a probiotic, sure, it, it may not take root, but if you keep giving it, it's going to establish a presence there. And now the idea is a probiotic is a preparation containing live microorganisms which, given in sufficient numbers, exert health benefits, et cetera, et cetera. So this, this sounds very good. There's even a prebiotic, a substance which stimulates the growth of a probiotic, and a symbiotic is a mixture of both of them. I mean, this is nonsense, but uh, this, this is just in its infancy as far as medical practice, but it's become a commercial big thing. Uh, if you go to Whole Foods over in Washington, there's a wonderful case there uh, which says, health for life, health for beauty, acidophilus probiotics, and there, you know, there's a whole thing here. Oh, some of these are wonderful. Flora Smart. And if you look down here, look at the price, $39.99, it gets better. Ultimate Flora, <laughs> you've got adult formula, senior for formula, vaginal formula, uh, critical care formula. Then there's another one, uh, Gerodophilus. Keep, keep looking at these prices, I mean they're absolutely horrendous. Multidophilus. Well, if you go down Washington to Hillers, you can see they're selling a culture called the kefir and in various flavors. And this one I love. This is from the Danon folks. Uh, they, they brought out a, something called Activia in Europe, which, which their stock soared. They sold and made $100 million the first year. Dan Active is on the market because it supposedly has something to do with immunity. And they even have Lactobacillus casei immunitas. <laughs> well, this is, this is a formula for great commercial success. It really is. Uh, but the question is, are people getting their money's worth? And I have to tell you that in, in terms of, of good, 
clinical trial type uh, studies of probiotics, th there are a few examples of some triumphs. Uh, there's pretty good evidence that certain preparations um, will shorten the duration of, of an infectious diarrhea, particularly in kids. I don't want to go into detail, but, but there's clear evidence that you can shorten the diarrhea probably from three days to two days for whatever that's worth with a probiotic preparation. There's pretty good evidence that certain probiotics are effective in preventing antibiotic or, or in treating antibiotic associated diarrhea. Some evidence uh, as far as traveler's diarrhea maybe, maybe having a mitigating effect. Yogurt is good for lactose intolerant people because the bugs in the yogurt, first of all, dissolve some of the lactose in the milk products and also produce lactase when you ingest it. So if you like yogurt, uh, keep eating it. Uh, but beyond this, it really gets murky. A lot of claims are made and they're, they're totally unsubstantiated. I, I, I love it what, what somebody said uh, that uh, well, this was the, uh, I think, uh, one of the microbiologic societies saying claims for probiotics have been based more on enthusiasm than on evidence. Uh, and uh, these, these basically are, are unreliable for a variety of reasons. Uh, I said, first of all, clinically proven effects are very few. Uh, problem with strain selection, because uh, it's very strain specific. This strain will do something, that strain will not do it. And, uh, then there's uh, preparation quality is variable. That, those, those pricey things that I showed you there, I claim to have you know, 8 billion of this and 6 billion of that. Well, how the hell do you know? The FDA doesn't control these things. Don't know anything about dose response curves, don't know anything about shelf life, and there are safety issues. Uh, there was a clinical trial in the Netherlands involving probiotics where they got an excess of deaths in the, in the treated patients. So it's. Uh, I guess what I say is stay tuned. You'll hear a lot more about probiotics. There is something to it, and it will emerge as science, but right now it's, it's pretty, pretty murky. So if you like yogurt, go on eating it, but don't spend your money and tell your patients not to spend their money on this other stuff. It just isn't worth it. All right. Thank you.